for curatorial affairs and re assumed this current post after serving 13 years as the museum's first curator of music and performing arts. In that role, she built a collection of more than 4,000 objects and curated the museum's inaugural permanent music exhibition, Musical Crossroads, co-curated the museum's grand opening music festival, Freedom Sounds, a community celebration, and the 2019 Smithsonian Year of Music Initiative and served as chair of the Smithsonian Music Executive Committee, a position she still holds today. Recent projects included co-hosting the award-winning Sirius XM podcast series, All Music is Black Music, and serving as contributing producer on Smithsonian's folk, uh, the Folkway Smithsonian Anthology of Hip Hop and Rap, which came out in 2021. Before joining the Smithsonian, Reese was a senior program officer at the National Endowment for the Humanities and worked in several museums, including the Louis Armstrong House and Archives, Brooklyn Historical Society, New Jersey State Museum, and the Motown Historical Museum. I wanna say Motown. Reese studied American studies and music at Scripps College, American culture and music museum practice at the University of Michigan and performed performance studies at New York University. And she currently serves on the boards of her alma mater, Scripps College, and the Society for Ethnomusicology. Her remarks in part will be drawn from her forthcoming book, which you can get today at the table, um, Musical Crossroads, Stories Behind the Objects of African-American Music that will explore the meanings underlying the objects on display at the Smithsonian. She will explain how these objects expand our understanding, at least I think she will, uh, our understanding of the culture of African-American music making and the foundation is built in the United States and around the world. In this book, as I mentioned, to be released March 7th, but a few copies are available. She says, quote, the objects of African-American music history embody the stories of individuals and community perspectives and experiences. Some objects speak to the obstacles challenges and injustices African-Americans encounter due to systemic racism and personal bias. Others speak to accomplishments and achievements against the odds and capture people's emotional, spiritual, and bodily experiences with music alone and with others. Material culture has been a growing field of interest for decades and scholarship on the topic continues to inform the work of academics, museum curators, archivists and others who are interested in the tangible objects that humans create, use, and keep, end quote, page 15. I was privileged to receive a review copy of the book and found it to be like a visit to the museum exhibition with a contextual core of history. You're reading the chapter and going along and then squirrel, there's an exhibit that you have to stop and read about, different images, different texts, different side notes that enrich and enhance the chapter narrative. I, I was just so captured by it. It's just like being at the museum. A fur as further stated in the book, the object served as a biography providing context for original use, purpose, and how that context changes over time, which is especially noteworthy, for example, when sound was not recorded. Reese wrote, but while this aspect of Black music's early history remains elusive in the material culture record, objects and artifacts in conjunction with written accounts help us to reconstruct the persistence and development of African, rhythm, tri African rhythmic traditions in Black music, end quote, page 52. As she further noted, quote, history shaped by the stories of culture values and wants to tell. So true. The history of African-American music does not have to be framed through one particular lens. Many things can define it at once. Objects offer a pathway in identifying the questions waiting to be asked, studying difficulties. Oops, there we go. Uh, studying the material culture of African American music allows us to consider how that history is being written, discussed, and defined. Music's material culture encourages us to be more expansive in defining African American music, 
building a foundation for future research that embraces multiple narratives that coexist under one umbrella, end quote, page 51. It reminds me so much of what Laurel Thatcher Ulrich said, which is that, um, you know, no well-behaved women are in history, but it's also that it depends on who's writing the history. So I'm very eager as you are to hear from Dr. Reese, but I would be remiss if I did not also share that her daughter is a graduate student in VCU's physical therapy program. So Dr. Reese is a proud member of our Ramley. And yes, that's what to say. And her daughter's graduating in May. In 2022, Dr. Reese received the Society for Ethnomusicology's Judith McCullough Public Sector Award. So please join me welcoming Dewan Lynn Reese as our 23rd lecturer for VCU Libraries Black History Month lecture series. Good evening. Oh, I love it when people speak back to me. Okay, just get a little situated here. I've been preparing for this for a little while and uh, I have to confess, I am an awful editor. There's always more when I'm doing the exhibit, when doing the book, I don't like leaving anybody out. So I, I have a lot of content here, but I hope I get through it and I hope you find it as fascinating as I do. So Musical Crossroads, Stories Behind the Objects of African-American Music, highlights objects from the museum's collection through the lens of material culture studies. Today, there are over 4,000 music-related objects in the museum's collection. These objects are the tangible evidence of music's existence, or more simply, music's material culture. This material culture comes with its own methodology to study it, and when approached in this way, illustrates the historical, cultural, and educational value that these collections hold for audiences worldwide. A material culture approach sees an object as a primary source that functions as an agent and mediator between the past and present. Material culture research and music can push the boundaries of historical analysis and contemporary interpretation and loosens the constraints we have to the written word by letting objects guide us to the multiple stories that are still waiting to be unearthed. Music is at a center of an ecosystem that lives and thrives through a network of connections and encounters among people, communities, places, organizations, and institutions. A song is never just a song. There's always someone who's produced it or someone who's sang it, who was influenced by someone growing up. There is always a region that can influence that story. And there's so many other layers that we can talk about music in, in this interesting way. The objects that make their journeys to museums like the National Museum of African American History and Culture get there in a myriad of ways. Some artifacts arrive well-documented with pages of descriptive historical background pre-established for museum staff to work from as they strive to make the information publicly available. Others come as rare or recently discovered items with a murky provenance histories that leave something to be desired in the object's story. There are several steps in, in reviewing objects. And I've outlined them here, just so you can remember them as we go through the many stories we're going to go to. There's identification. What is it? Who made it? Um, who used it? Evaluation. What kind of condition is it in? Um, how was it used? Were there multiple ways something was used? Cultural analysis. And that's really putting things in the context of its original use and also years later? Does something function in the same way that it did when it was originated? Does a guitar, is a guitar just a guitar when it was invented or does it become something else when it becomes a cherished object? And finally, interpretation. And that's what 
we do in museums as curators, when we do exhibits and books and all the other projects, we interpret the stories based on the facts that we find. And there's just one story because no one has a definitive hold on history. So my story is just my interpretation of an object. Each one of you may have a different interpretation based on your facts. And that's what I love about history is that we all bring something to it. Objects can point us to information that the written record of newspapers, magazines, or historical documents often does not provide by complete omission or racially biased interpretation. For example, and I think I just gave it away, this first glance of Gospel Hymns Number no. 2, published by P.P. P. Bliss and Ira D. Sankey in 1876, is simply a 19th century book with a hardcover and black printing. However, once you ask a question about who owned the book, it will dramatically alter the meaning and significance of this particular hymnal. hymnal. This book was included in a collection of items belonging to Harriet Tubman that were donated to the museum by a historian named Charles Bloxon, who was founder of the Charles L. Bloxon Afro-American Collection at Temple University. Tubman's great niece, Eva Stewart Northrup, was raised by Tubman and inherited the items from her. The collection was eventually passed on to Northrop's daughter, Merlene Wilkins, who bequeathed it to Bloxon in her will. Inside the hymnal are 112 pages of hymn lyrics. No musical notation is included, which was a common practice with hymn books published during this time. According to Kate Clifford Larson, this hymn book most likely came from one of the churches Tubman attended. And Northrop or Wilkins probably wrote the inscription of Tubman's name inside since Tubman could neither read or write. Sorry, I don't have a page of the interior. But even this is a fact that perhaps reflects what Tubman wanted to, the public to believe. Her retention of the hymnal challenges the historical record by forcing us to consider what we know about her as a historical figure versus the more intimate side of her life and her family relationships. The association with her established during this identif identification stage raises question about, questions about what this hymnal meant to Tubman. How did she acquire it? And how did she use it at home? Did keeping this book reflect her aspirations for literacy? What kind of engagement did she have flipping through these pages containing words she could not read, but to songs she knew so well? Harriet Tubman was a deeply religious woman who drew strength and comfort from spirituals and hymns. It's easy to see how this one small book became one of her most cherished items. In working with objects, finding ways to discern their meaning is a critical part of the process. Sense transforms an object into a multi-dimensional repository of stories, people, and events. And the stories and connections offer much more than a simple description can. I'm gonna go through with the rest of my talk taking uh, segments from the book that I've divided into to five chapters. The first chapter looks at the material culture approach of what that really is. The, the next chapter looks at roots and branches. And when I talk about roots and branches, we talk about what are, what are the roots of African-American music? It's rooted in the arrival of the first enslaved Africans to the North American continent and the circumstances in which they had to live and, and fight against. So the roots are, are not just performative techniques or musical instruments. It's also the context in which this music was created and the struggle for liberty and freedom um, in a country that saw them as not worthy. Here's another interesting object, the Cameron violin. Clarence P. Cameron donated this childhood violin to the museum to highlight a story that he believed connected the violin to an enslaved maker. Their modifications and scattered traces of repaired cracks on the instrument's soundboard, and they provide visual evidence of the two centuries of playing this instrument withstood. The physical marks illustrate the care its owners took to keep the instrument playable for many years and helped to unravel its history. Cameron received the violin from Alice Austin Allen, a family friend when he needed something to play in fifth grade. The, the violin had belonged to Allen's late father, W.L. Austin. 
Accompanying the instrument was a yellow note card created by Austin that listed the violin's black owners going back over 200 years to its first documented owner, Joseph Fox. Austin believed that Joseph Fox was made the instrument. And on the card, he dated the instrument to circa 1809 and recorded its former owners as W.L. Austin, Richard Burton, Henry Cole, Clark of Ellisville, Henry Buckley, and Joseph Fox. When the violin arrived at the museum, staff examined the instrument and explored genealogical records for the former, former owners documented on the note card. However, they found conflictingly suggested, what they found suggested that the instrument was actually made in Central Europe between the 1820s and the 1870s. The modest prices of these violins made them popular in places like the United States, where musicians, including enslaved black violinists, played them at home for events like social dances. The genealogical records did indicate that some of the former owners had advanced carpentry skills. W.L. Austin was a carriage maker, Henry Cole a chair maker, and they could have been responsible for the repairs and fill-ins found on the soundboard. Perhaps then the story of the enslaved maker grew from the real actions of the owners who cared for the instrument. Cameron's violin raises many questions that are not easily answered, but it provides researchers with an opportunity to investigate the history of black violinists maintaining and passing down instruments from one generation to the next. Another topic and theme to think about when we talk about the roots and branches of African-American music is the line between sacred and secular. In African traditions, the, the line is not really finely drawn. The sacred and the secular blur onto one another. Which brings us to this object. It's a large poster advertising the 1973 Memphis Gospel Festival, which was held in Memphis, Tennessee's Mid-South Coliseum. It's printed by the Globe Poster Printing Corporation, a Baltimore-based company that was known for using fluorescent day glow ink and large bold type on its posters. Some of you who go back far enough may have seen these posters on trees and, and, and street signs and the like. Globe was well known for doing posters for jazz, gospel, rhythm and blues, funk, auto racing, fights, and many other things. Um, the festival featured leading gospel artists and groups, including Reverend James Cleveland, Inez Andrews, the Swan Silvertones, and the world famous Soul Stirrers. Ford Nelson from the influential Memphis R&B and gospel station WDIA served as master of ceremonies. The artists featured on the festival demonstrate the blend of sacred and secular expressions that have long ca characterized gospel. For example, James Cleveland, his stature is well established as a leading guardian of the gospel tradition. He co-founded the Gospel Music Workshop of America in 1968, but he also found success with gospel adaptations of secular songs. After the Memphis Gospel Festival, Cleveland's reinterpretation of Gladys Knight and the Pips, You're the Best Thing That Ever Happened to Me, quickly rose to the top of the Billboard gospel charts. Two of the other groups on the poster, the Soul Stirrers and the Violinaires, were training grounds for leading soul singers of the 60s, featuring Sam Cooke and Wilson Pickett. The 1973 festival demonstrates gospel music spread from the traditional place within the church to a variety of secular venues as its influence on popular culture solidified and on popular music. In the 40s and 50s, there were crossover artists such as Rosetta Tharp and the Ward Singers, and the, the tremendous success of Mahalia Jackson, who had a television show and her own radio show. In 1969, just a few years before the festival, Edwin Hawkins' R&B-influenced hit recording of Oh Happy Day re-emphasized gospel's crossover, crossover potential, unofficially marking it, moving it from traditional to contemporary gospel. And we see that influence in rhythm and blues and soul music as well.
another way to talk about um, the changes from the roots and the branches, excuse me, but there is, okay, this is the right slide, or, or the instruments. The enslaved obviously did not bring their own instruments with them um, when they were forced migration, but there took a lot of ingenuity and people making do of household parts and things around the house that you could use to make instruments. And I wanted to talk a little bit about here with a couple examples here. On the far right, we have Bo Diddley's uh, Red Gresh G6138 model square guitar made in 2005. The rectangular guitar, if you know Bo Diddley, is his trademark. And Diddley was one of the architects of rock and roll and asserted the music's subversive attitude with his inventive mind and the rectangular guitar of his own making. Bo Diddley was famous for his five accent clave rhythm. It was his sonic signature and it can be heard in rock and roll and popular music today. He was also an innovative guitarist who used distortion, feedback, and a complex aggressive strumming style to emphasize the sharp signature rhythms in his music. Needing a smaller instrument that was less restrictive to give him more freedom to jump around the stage, he made this first rectangular guitar in 1945 as an experiment. Bo Diddley was known for experiments. I know when collecting this object, um, I went to one of his storage facilities and he had all kinds of uh, electronical equipment, washboards, all bits and pieces that he would use to experiment with sound. By 1958, he had built more than two dozen iterations of this rectangular guitar. And at that point, he struck a deal with Gresh's guitar company to build a custom made based on his design. This partnership between Diddley and Gresh was an outcome of his ingenuity and creativity, working with everyday materials and technologies to build instruments and experiment with new, so new sounds. Bit Diddley did not need to pay Gresh to come up with the concept. That innovation was all his own and his inspiration to develop a new guitar prompts a reconsideration of rock and roll's history and how African-American musical and technological innovations are situated within the popular narrative. Right next to that on the left, we look at the modern instrument to, of today of, of more contemporary music. Like their historical counterparts, modern musical instruments also lend themselves to examinations and document how African-American musicians spur on innovation. This is an Akai, Akai MPC and Moog synthesizer belonging to James Yancey, also known as Jay Dilla, and exemplified the instrumental possibilities of hip hop production. He wove songs together on this gear by chopping, looping, and manipulating samples drawn from across the broad spectrum of music he encountered. You can even, when you look closely, I don't know if you can see it here, you can see the wear and tear on the MPC's gray drum keys and knowing that they're the residual marks caused by hours of Jay Dilla spent tapping beats. Studying the loss and paint and heavy use of some keys might provide further insight into the producer's preferences. He projected his cerebral aesthetics and keen ear for crafting beats that occasionally confounded rappers with their intricacies. Then we have other instruments. We, in the exhibition, we talk about the banjo and African-American music has benefit, benefited tremendously from studying musical instru instruments, but it's also been a challenge because African-American material culture was not valued at a, at a time. And so it is difficult to find objects that have the direct provenance. So here's a gourd banjo we have in our collection. There's nothing you can say really definitive about it. It didn't come with any notation. There's no maker's mark. There's no written date of manufacture. Um, there's, there's nothing to really guide its basic documentation, but just obs obs observation. Frets are missing from along the rough neck of the banjo and no skin remains to stretch across the scored rim. There are broken strings uh, that curl asymmetrically and a dowel stick holding the neck and body together. And a rounded headstock has four tuning pegs that just 
jut out behind. As with many instruments of the 18th and 19th century, the own unknown early history of his banjo echoes the invisibility and exploitation of African Americans during this time. Still, the combination of the gourd banjo also shows the blending of African and Western European traditions, since the banjo did come to the Americas as, as an African instrument and has changed over time to be the banjo that we, we know of today. The banjo has a complicated history. Um, as it went through various permutations, it eventually became strongly associated with minstrelsy and its connections to African-Americans was further distance. So it is, is interesting, we have a banjo revival today. If you've been listening to music in the last 20 years, the Carolina Chocolate Drops, the Ebony Hillbillies, um, Rhiannon Giddens, Dom Flemons, people like that, who are reclaiming the African-American history of the banjo. But just as I talked about the gourd banjo having no provenance, we've, we did find a situation where we were able to tie a particular banjo to an African-American. Here I am pictured here with the Clark family. Mr. Clark had um, picked up this, this banjo in an auction that had a banjo and a guitar. And he actually really wanted the guitar, but he got the banjo and he noticed there some markings on it. It had the name Charles P. Stinson on it. And he went to one of the banjo listservs and these are serious collectors, will weigh in on anything. And he, he posed the topic about what could this banjo be? And everyone came back to him and telling me it's a Stinson banjo. This is a, a minstrel performer who played banjos over time, but also set up his own shop um, and worked with the J.H. Buckaby company to manufacture ban banjos that he would build with his students and teach them how to play. It was a rarity to have something, to have that kind of strong provenance. So it was a very exciting object to acquire uh, in the museum with the, the traditional invisibility of the African-Americans, the history of the African-American connections to the banjo. In the late 19th century, the banjo's place, as I said, was gradually superseded by that of the guitar. The banjo diminished in black culture, but remained important in rural white communities. And that's why sometimes people don't equate the banjo with African-Americans. Stinson's story demonstrates how black musicians negotiated the constraints of black face minstrelsy to make success, successful careers in the entertainment industry. And in talking about the roots, we also talk about one of the things I was committed to doing in, in doing the exhibit and doing the, the book is that my stories are about African-American music. It is inclusive and represents all kinds of music making despite genres. And so historically, another phenomenon that people think of as new is African-Americans classical music. So take, for example, this poster advertising a performance by soprano Maddie Wilkes, which points to different classical music questions about African-Americans. The potential narratives you can talk about include gender, skin color, class, ethnicity, geographical region, or time period come into play. But as with many of her generation, Wilkes' story is incomplete and her work straddling classical music and early American musical theater is an area ripe for further research. Like other black female classical vocalists of her era, Wilkes was not allowed to play and have access to the same concert hall venues as white performers did. So her opportunities performed were on the popular theater circuit. Here you can see on the bill that she is performing with uh, Burt Williams and George Walker who were known for their minstrel, blackface minstrel routines. And so she's trying to continue on as a classical singer, but she has to do it in a popular venue because of the opportunities that are not um, available to her. And we can't talk, not talk about the roots and branches of African-American music without talking about the spirituals. Paul Johnson was arguably the most visible and influential proponent of Negro spirituals in the first half of the 20th century. 
However, as director of the Hall Johnson Choir, he performed in more than 30 feature length films, appeared on Broadway and toured across the country and internationally for over 30 years. He had a platform and profound influence in shaping public perceptions about African-Americans and their musical traditions. This collection was donated to the museum by Dr. Eugene Thaman Simpson, who became custodian of the archive at the family's request after Johnson died of burns, he received in a fire at his Harlem apartment in 1970. The archive is a wealth of information. It includes business papers, royalty statements, correspondence, photographs, personal diaries, camera, cigarette holders, a lighter, orchestral scores, and music manuscripts. It's a record of his professional career and artistic output, and also offers interests um, entree into his ideas and hobbies. Paul Johnson's interest in spirituals was inspired by the songs that he heard from his grandmother, who lived in slavery for 30 years. Early in his career, he realized the sounds of the spirituals as they were meant to be sung would eventually disappear. And so he committed himself to educating audiences about the way, quote, the American Negro slaves created, propagated, and illuminated an art form which was and still is unique in the world of music. Part of Johnson's advocacy for the spiritual, aside from leading performances, was required defending the performances of the choir when it became a target of racialized scrutiny, caricature, or objectification. Johnson's responses to these insults usually took the form of long, detailed letters of many that we have in the collection. This letter here, addressed to Mr. Kasson, refers to a letter that Johnson wrote in November 1937, but did not mail at the time. After a performance at the University of Washington, the month before, Johnson read the university's newspaper articles to promote the event. In a seven page typewritten letter, he refutes every statement falsely attributed to him, moving back and forth between righteous indignation and snarkiness. On page four, he writes, quote, it should not be necessary to point out to any university student that the suffix stir signifies occupation, as in gangster, trickster, teamster, et cetera, et cetera. When one wishes to speak contemptuously of Negroes, the correct term is darkies, not darksters. Johnson's effort to educate and present spirituals as an original work of art was also in tension with the inclination of some audiences to interpret the choir's performance as a, justice, as a justification for their own biases and racist attitudes. Johnson finally closes his letter with a note of contrition and expression of his frustration with the challenges he faces in realizing his goals. He writes, though this whole affair was to us miserable, I am writing with no real ill feeling toward you or the author of the articles. It is just another example of the failure to take Negroes seriously that is so common that is so common in this world. Another way to look at the roots and the, the ties of African-Americans to certain instruments is when we talk about the saxophone. The saxophone we find has a, actually a special place in African-American culture. Even when it was introduced in Western Europe, there was not people didn't really take to it very much and there wasn't a lot of music written for it. So it was not until um, black popular musicians and ragtime and jazz in the early 20th century started to pick up the instrument. The instrument was a blank slate, so to speak. And so black musicians used it to their own ends to invent and um, inspire and innovate in their own musical language. It, it was particularly useful for its timbral flexibility in which you could use the hooks and growls and wails and screams that are common in such vocal musics like the blues. The, the instrument's relative newness also made it a symbol of modernity for a time, at a time when Black Americans were forging new ways, forging out of the painful legacies of slavery in the early 20th century and looking at new ways to present themselves and to share their culture. This particular, and we have a 3D scan of this, which is, is wonderful, is um, a 
a saxophone, one of two known saxophones played by Charlie Parker. Um, in 1947, the H. N. White Company of Cleveland gave him an endorsement deal and pro produced this customized engraved King Super 20 saxophone for him. The custom horn has an enlarged bore and a modified key action to support Par Parker's virtuosic technique. And he's, we can assume that he played this horn on many of his recordings between 1948 and 1954. Another running theme uh, about African music, African American music is the role of community. And in this chapter, we talk about music in the community and music of the community. The importance of community is always central to discussions about African-American music making. A community is defined in this context by shared cultural heritage and experience and a collective sense of purpose in the struggle for freedom. And it's demonstrated in a variety of cultural practices and performance traditions, such as the ring shout, call and response, improvisation, and the equal value placed on the individual performance and group participation. Community is also celebrated in the value of communal music making and the power it has in putting movements into action. Community also extends to the countless ways music lives in society and is activated by a broad network of smaller community formations. Here in this example, we have Joseph Douglas, who was a celebrated bi black violinist of the early 20th century and who happened to be the grandson of abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Joseph Douglas studied at the Boston Conservatory and rose to national prominence after performing at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. He was a music educator at Howard University and New York City's music school settlement for the colored. And by the end of his career, he had played and performed at every black educational institution in the United States. On the left here, we have a letter from Douglas Joseph Douglas to activist Mary Church Terrell. Douglas's personalized stationery advertises his availability for recitals, concerts, and church services. The mention of church service uh, should not go uninterpreted. Ignored by white audiences, black artists also depended on the churches and HBCUs as performance venues. Douglas writes to accept Mary Church Terrell's invitation to perform at Harriet Beecher Stowe's 100th birthday. And his correspondence with her also underscores the important role of the mutuality of community support. As a founder of the National Association of Colored Women, Terrell was a leading figure in the development of a national network of black women's associations. And they worked together to fight racial discrimination and to aid poor families in their communities. African-American music making both by individuals and communities can also be shaped by a sense of place. Think about such cities as New Orleans. What do you think of? Good, Mississippi, Chicago, urban blues, East Coast, West Coast. Very good, you can be livened up a little bit, but overall good. So here in, um, this was one of my, my favorite acquisitions just because the story is so uh, poignant. Uh, this is Bill Hawkins. He was the first black DJ in Cleveland, Ohio. Bill Hawkins came to Cleveland via um, Alabama. He also worked as a Pullman Porter, but had his eyes set on pursuing a radio career um, and eventually settled in Cleveland. He leaned into his entrepreneurial ambitions and decided he, he eventually signed with Cleveland's WJW radio station and began hosting his first radio program. Since he wasn't given a studio inside the station, he had to depend on doing remote locations throughout the neighborhood. But after his show grew a sizable audience, he put up a record store where he would host his radio shows, as you see here, 
with artists. That's Earl Bostick there, Mary Lou Williams, the great uh, jazz composer, pianist there, where he would have radio shows. Uh, he tried his hand at, at recording, and that's one of his labels, Talk Records, and also supporting the community. He appealed to all ages with programs and dealt with all types of music. And the pinnacle of his connection to Cleveland's African-American community, and we'll talk about this a little later, is the centralities of these Black neighborhoods, these business sectors that were safe spaces for African-Americans to shop, to worship, to, to do anything in, in their communities. This collection came to us by way of a storyteller named W. Allen Taylor. Um, and he was given this collection by a family. W. Allen Taylor had met Bill Hawkins just once, uh, sat in his office and had a conversation with him for 15 minutes. He later found out, and this was after Bill Hawkins had passed away, that he was his father. So Alan Taylor brought these items to, to the museum, but also did his own reclamation of learning about his father and created a one-man show in search of my father, Walk and Talk and Bill Hawkins. It, is, it centers the play around the curiosity of reimagining the life and persona about a parent you never got to know. We can also talk about regions in Atlanta, which has been called the Black Mecca since the early 1970s. This fitted baseball cap and costume trace the story of Outkast, the Atlanta-based hip hop duo of Big Boy and Andre 3000. Atlanta was a new hub of hip hop culture and Big Boy was known for wearing sports gear this Atlanta Braves hat happened to coincide with the release of Big Boy Patton's album, Vicious Lies and Dangerous Rumors. The iconic A in rainbow colors to match the front cover of Big Boy's new album. It was distributed to fans who attended a CD signing at a, at a record store in Atlanta in two, 2013. And Big Boy, as I said, is known for wearing Atlanta sports apparel and making it part of his stage persona. Andre 3000 wore this multicolored cape while performing Bombs Over Baghdad on the Chris Rock Show in 2000. The costume creates a rainbow effect using multiple feather boas in different colors attached to a set of oversized black shoulder pads. Within the broader cultural landscape of the early 25th century and within the landscape of hip hop, Andre 3000's feather boa cape represents a challenge to narrow concepts of masculinity opposed upon hip hop culture. After their record label, LaFace Records granted the group increased control of their image. Outkast adopted a style that branded Atlanta as part of its image and started to segue into some of the Afrofuturist aesthetic of artists like George Clinton and Sly Stone. You can't talk about community without talking about education. Education has always had an important role in the quest for freedom, allowing African Americans to further their efforts to acquire the same rights and privileges that were supposed to be granted to all citizens. Music education served a unique purpose. It not only provided basic musical training, but was also used to enhance students' awareness of the history, heritage, and accomplishments of African Americans as well as to instill a value of discipline, practice, and working together toward common goals to inspire confidence and the, affirm the importance of perseverance and fortitude in negotiating the challenges that came with being Black in the United States. This is Dr. William P. Foster and the famous Marching 100 of Florida A&M University. Here, Dr. Foster stands in this photograph with five of his marching band 100 students. When he arrived as band director in 1946, he found the band struggling without resources. The group only had 16 members and many instruments were damaged beyond repair. Over time, Dr. Foster set about making enormous improvements. He transformed the group by introducing complex routines and beginning in the 1960s, energetic choreography into their halftime shows. Combining traditional techniques with vibrant interpretations of Black popular music and dance, 
Dr. William P. Foster shaped the direction of college bands around the country. His innovative vision extended the work of earlier groups like James Reese Europe's 369th Infantry Band and the, and the FAMU marching bands of the early 20th century, which combined military precision with popular elements borrowed from traveling circus bands. On the left, we have the classic Florida A&M orange and green colors and the jacket and shako that was worn by student Ernest Brown, who played tenor sax in the Marching 100. Signs of extensive wear in the jacket's interior lining point to his having been used by successive students over many years. This Marching 100 uniform illustrates the reality that like other black institutions, HBCUs had often had to make creative use of limited resources. Just as HBCUs were important venues for music education in black communities, they are also key sites for communities themselves for popular music performance. You'll notice, you may recognize some of the style. This is another GLOW poster uh, for a 1969 concert that James Brown gave at FAMU, which is called. Um, the features of the poster suggest that its creators meant to speak directly to the black community of Tallahassee. Instead of explaining where to purchase tickets, the poster assumes viewers know where to look, simply instructing them to find the tickets in the usual places. And the second, the advertisement says, is a show for the entire family, inviting residents from all over the city. This element highlights HBCU's role in connecting Southern Black neighborhoods to the wider world of Black entertainment and culture. Solo performances are also supported by a network of other communities. Here, Eunice Wayman gives a concert in Philadelphia that's supported by the Philadelphia branch of the National Association of Negro Musicians and the Young People's Music Club. Eunice Wayman is better known as Nina Simone. And this is when she was first starting out her career with the intention of becoming a classical pianist. The event sponsors the Philadelphia branch of the National Association of Negro Musicians was founded in 1919 to support the needs of professional musicians, particularly those who specialized and trained in classical traditions. It provided workshops, concerts, recitals, youth programs, and panel discussions that were important about issues that were important to the membership and served as a resource and support systems for black musicians who struggled to get the same opportunities and respect that white musicians received. It's just one of many examples of the varied ways that African Americans came together to support the aspirations of an individual. As Nina Simone pursued her career, we do know her that she did not pursue the classical career, but became uh, a popular vocalist, uh, one that can't be defined or limited to any one genre. As, as the 60s went by, her music and her performance wardrobe increasingly took on political tones amidst the civil rights and the Black arts movement. And her engagement with the issues of the day, increasing engagement with the issues of the day, was a result of her long friendship with playwright Lorraine Hansberry, who inspired Simone to speak about what she was seeing and experiencing. After Lorraine Hansberry's death, Nina Simone wrote a song to be young, gifted, and Black, which celebrates young people whom Simone felt needed positive role models and messaging to counter the racism that frequently took their innocence at young ages. This is a very United States specific African American experience song. But in Nina's own, Nina Simone's own collection, we found these 45s of recordings of To Young, Gifted, and Black, one in Norwegian, one in Japanese. And there's, there's a Jamaican version as well. And I just wanted to play just a little excerpt because you wonder about the translation about the song. The first verse goes, To Be Young, Gifted, and Black, Oh, what a lovely, precious dream to be young, gifted, and Black. Open your heart to what I mean. 
the Norwegian translation, which I'm going to play a sample. You don't do a music presentation without music. You beautiful black child with your bright smile, your legends and your stories on the gazelle or the elephant. You got rid of me quickly from the burden of my prejudices. You did it without knowing beautiful black child. And if we can play the example. So this, this collection just raises all kinds of questions for me. Um, you know, the popularity of the song overseas, you wonder what did Dina Simone think of these translations and these versions and what was going on? I mean, the song came out in 1970. So, you know, 1968, the, the King has been assassinated you know, when the Vietnam War, all these things are going on and this awareness, this international awareness, these are, these are things that are kind of a researcher's dream. We can't talk about community without talking about home life. Um, taking piano lessons, I'm one, I'm sure there are many of you or whatever instrument you chose. Uh, this includes performing during recitals and we are lucky to have, this is Janet Jackson's recital, piano recital dress um, that she played at her first piano recital when she was eight years old. As long as Janet Jackson has been in the public eye and she's part of a famous family, she did do the things that normal children did. Um, on the left over here is a key that she used to, she had one of her chores, she had to come home after school and clean the animal cages. And so this was a key that she used. Um, it was a key that probably meant something to her because she eventually turned it into an earring and became known, um, it's worn on the cover of this, this cassette cover and, and many performances. But it just, just goes to show you that the everyday experiences that, Music and these stories are, are not about, it's about the everyday experiences we have with music, not just the ones that we have on a stage. And of course, um, community, you cannot not talk about the black church. Since the period of American slavery, it has been the central anchor institution in black communities across the United States. In addition to their priestly and prophetic roles in, in leading communities in protests and praise and seasons of suffering and hope, Black churches have long offered everyday Black Americans opportunities for human dignity, social action, interaction, and leadership training. Moreover, the Black church has also played a pivotal role in broadening America's cultural soundscape through the applications of African-American music aesthetics as we talked about earlier in gospel. Here is a piano that was um, used in Chicago's Pilgrim Baptist Church. Um, it was a rehearsal piano for Thomas Dorsey, who's otherwise known as the father of gospel. He used this for more than 30 years with his rehearsals with choirs and soloists, including Albertina Walker, Mahalia Jackson, and Aretha Franklin. Um, Dorsey's piano also hints at the centrality of the great migration of, of African Americans leaving the South to find and make their way in urban communities in the North and, and Midwest. Dorsey himself was a former blues man who had remigrated to Chicago and brought his Southern traditions of the blues in his workings of gospel music. The piano acquires another more significant role in that Chicago Pilgrim, Pilgrim Baptist Church, a historic church, was gutted by a fire in 2006. 
this piano happened to not be there. All of Dorsey's manuscripts and other priceless artifacts were destroyed. So it's the only surviving object from the church's early years and highlights the vulnerability and irre irreplaceability of cultural heritage. But it's not only just the black church, there are other religious institutions. African-Americans follow a variety of religion, religions, each with their own musical styles and worship traditions. In the early 1900s, a number of small non-Christian black religious organizations were formed based on religious identity rather than society's racial hierarchies. The Commandment Keepers, a congregation of black Hebrews founded by Rabbi Wentworth Arthur Matthew, Matthew in Harlem in 1919 was one of these organizations. Matthew was an immigrant from St. Kitts and his arrival in Harlem coincided with the emergence of new ideologies related to black identity and Pan-African solidarity. And of course, we can't talk about the neighborhoods and the clubs and venues that provided places for uh, performers to perform, for musicians to perform, and also African-American safe spaces where they could enjoy entertainment in their own communities. We love this map. This is a map that appeared in the magazine in about 1933, where we talk about Harlem, which was the preeminent center of African-American culture um, in the early 20th century, uh, attracting Southern black migrants who made a mass exodus after World War I. The Harlem Renaissance, as we like to talk about it, was a community spirit of creativity, innovation, cultural affirmation, and intellectual engagement and co collective community making. And so you can see the neighborhood's club scene. It was where you had blacks and white coming to places like the Cotton Club, the Apollo Theater, the Savoy Ballroom, and all the vibrancy and lightheartedness was part of those communities. And it's important to note that every community across the country had a black neighborhood or club scene. And uh, those of you for, for Richmond, I'm sure Richmond had places too that are part of the history. So this was not just in Harlem, but a, a, a growth across the country and communities worldwide. Even in the West, and here we have Bob City, which was a popular destination for musicians and the local community from 1949 to 1965. It originally started out as a waffle shop, but uh, Jimbo, who owned the place, got a, built a bandstand, got a piano and drum set, and reopened it as Bop City. It was a showcase for bebop and attracted a steady stream of the most renowned artists of the day. And Steve Jackson Jr., an aspiring photographer, befriended Jimbo Edwards and became a regular at Bop City, and we have a collection of his photographs that he took over time. Once again, these are safe spaces, um, interracial spaces, but also you see the safe spaces of men in the military having places that they can go when they can't go to where their other colleagues are going. And finally, when we think about community, we think about singing for justice. We think about community activism. Here's a slide about Resurrection City. In 1968, shortly before he was assassinated, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference launched the Poor People's Campaign, which was a multi-ethnic, multicultural movement to demand equal access to economic opportunities and security for all people. The weeks after King's assassination, protesters traveled to Washington, D.C. and built an encampment called Resurrection City on the National Mall. It lasted for a period of six weeks from May to June 23, 1968. And thousands of America's poor were joined by activists and artists to confront poverty, poverty as a national human rights issue. Among the artists who joined the protests were musician and civil rights activist, Reverend Frederick Douglas Kirkpatrick, who you see pictured here, who used music to teach about African-American history in the civil rights movement. Here you see him playing guitar with uh, singers who have lyric sheets. This photograph was taken by Baltimore-based photographer Robert Houston. Music performances and impromptu singing took all place around Resurrection City and around outside the Department of Agriculture. 
They even built its own encampment called the Mini Racist Soul Center. The center was built with plywood walls, one of which was transformed by demonstrators into a 12 panel mural. We are, are lucky to have several panels of that mural in the museum. And here's just one of them. And you can see the variety of messages uh, that people are trying to communicate about their, their situation. More recently, we have, um, in the wake of the massive Black Lives Matter protests, which erupted for weeks after the death of Freddie Gray, Prince came to Baltimore. In his statement, he, he said, his appearance was meant to be a catalyst for pause and reflection. And he wrote the song Baltimore to voice his express expressions of solidarity for the movement and to raise funds for the Baltimore based youth charities. This t shirt, you know, your typical concert memorabilia, it talks about the role that artists play in the realm of social activism, but it also talks about the things that we collect to help remember or to, to mark an event that's important to us. And on the photograph, this was another photograph taken during the, the protest during the period, um, a poignant photograph of children participating in the march, but also looking for community resources to support their band funding. The sign text references the long tradition of community bands in Baltimore in which the city's newly free black community held one of the largest parades in the country to celebrate the 15th amendment. Now here's a favorite of mine. Uh, and we're gonna get, get another musical example. This is You Are My Sunshine. Now oh, here we have Ray Charles, and one of the former governors of Louisiana, Jimmy Davis. Jimmy Davis actually copyrighted and originally recorded You Are My Sunshine. And in this letter here, um, he is writing to someone to talk about Ray Charles' version of his song. Jimmy Davis, you know, at this time was a staunch segregationist and trying to fight against the integration of Louisiana schools. But at the same time, he talks favorably, even though with racially tinged language about Ray Charles' version of You Are My Sunshine, talking about the wild treatment that he gives it. And so just to, to play it for you, and hopefully you know the song, You Are My Sunshine, My Only Sunshine. Let's play Ray's version. At Kroger, we believe that our high standards ensure fresher produce. Kroger, fresh for everyone. <laughs> So it's a little different than the original. Um, I had a lot of stuff here, so I'm gonna rush through these last few. Here is uh, Little Richard's Bible, which when you thumb through it, it came to us and, oops. well used and, and <laughs> marked up. Um, I think when looking through this Bible, which needed urgent conservation, you could also see how Little Richard's trying to reconcile the tensions with his own sexuality and his, his religious beliefs. Um, he would vacillate throughout his life, at one point himself calling himself an omnisexual. But we also know him for his flamboyant stage persona and the outfits 
of one which we see here. And his move back and forth between the sacred, sacred and secular worlds mirrored his personal struggles with his sexuality. But it also reflects the inseparability of sacred and secular music in his own work. You can see the influences of his Pentecostal church in his, in his style and performance. And this is a tension that he worked with throughout his life. Another example here is I wanted to talk about Paul Robeson, um, one of the first global activists who the narrative arc of his career as an artist and activist began during the Harlem Renaissance and really has been the template for musicians and entertainers who choose to use their public platform to protest American racism, social injustice, and other forms of social impression. In this recording, Songs of Free Men, Robeson was well known for being able to sing in very several languages and recorded songs in Russia, songs from Russia, Spain, Germany, and the United States. The songs reflected his activism and pointed to his support for anti-fascist struggles in Spain. Photographers do a lot to capture what's going on in African-American music. Here's a photograph by Anthony Barboza who changed the way black and brown women were represented in fashion and advertising. It reflects the persona that was central. And this is a photograph of Isaac Hayes and, and Pat Evans, um, but convention breaking that coincided with his recording, Hot Buttered Soul, which came out in 1969. Through the gold chains, furs and bald head, Hayes shifted the racist trope of the black man as dangerous to a more sensual human being who instilled comfort over fear. This is clearly illustrated by Hayes' moniker. He's also known as the Black Moses. One of the favorite objects in the exhibit is this uh, El Dorado Cadillac. And we talk about rock and roll music, um, particularly from its Black origins and how that gets lost from the popular narrative of the story. This, this Cadillac appeared in the 1984 documentary, Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll, um, in which Chuck Berry drove it across the stage of the Fox Theater. This was the same theater that turned him away as a child because he was Black. And so we talk about in the book how that narrative has been shifted, how the history, the roots of African-American performers has been removed from the popular narrative and how groups like Living Color, Fishbone, and other rock groups they're seen as outliers and don't really belong. It's complemented by this po poster of the Black Rock Coalition, which was founded for that very reason, to recognize the, the rights of, of people to play any music they don't seem deem to choose to play. And it, it's just kind of bringing the past and the present together, but trying to rewrite some of those narratives that have dominated music history for so long. And finally, I want to talk about the women. Black women historically connected, con contended with stereotypes and assumptions about their abilities as musicians. Um, sometimes thinking they're too weak to play or they can't play certain instruments or they're just vocalists singing on the stage and looking pretty. In 2013, Terry Lynn Carrington made history when she became the first woman to win the Grammy Award for Best Jazz Instrumental Album. She won as artist and producer on her album, Money, Jungle, Provocative, and Blue. It was a monumental achievement for Carrington and for all women working in jazz. And finally, this is a wonderful find. Some of you know about race records in the 1920s, the records that were targeted to black consumers. This is the ledger from Columbia Records of their race records archive. Um, you have all kinds of singers, Bessie Smith, Ethel Waters. Here we have a sheet of Clara Smith, what they were paid, what songs were recorded, whether their contracts were renewed. And as you know anything about the classic blues singers, they really were the proto-feminists of their period, um, you know, singing about sex and taking ownership of their own agency. And so they they created a legacy for. I think 
American female singers to follow, not only in the music themselves, but how they presented themselves in their own image. And finally, this simple little object is a sign from the Women's March in 2017 um, in Washington, DC, in which they draw upon the lyrics in a, a duet that Beyonce did with Jack White. When you hurt me, you hurt yourself. When you love me, you love yourself. Love God yourself. What I like about this job and what I like about these stories is that I believe material culture really gives us an opportunity to unearth what's not talked about, to change the dominant stories that we so easily believe and the people that we've forgotten or never heard about. With those objects, you can ask questions and find out new ideas, new people, new stories. And I encourage all of you, this is not something just a curator can do, but you can do with your own collections, with your own memorabilia. Ask questions. And when you go to an exhibit or when you hear a singer, you know, what lies behind the curtain? You'll find fascinating things and wonderful stories to tell. Thank you.